Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of 123 CMMC. My name is Dana Mantilla, and I am your host. And our guest today is Carl Bickmore. Hello, Carl. How are you? I'm well, thanks. How are you, Dana? Good, good, good. Welcome back. Good to see you again. Yes, yes. We have a very uh, interesting topic today that everybody needs to learn about. Well, it's the plague of modern life, if you yes, ask. Yes, it is. Phishing emails. Okay. So for all of those people out there that don't know what this is, which I don't think is going to be much in our audience, what is phishing? Well, maybe an, a, another way to reframe, reframe it is, um, you know, there's different ways that attackers that can come at you. And one of the most effective ways and one, one of the ways that is used most often now is a form of social engineering where people essentially fake who they are to get information from you or access to your data or to take advantage of you in some way. And so we all see these things in various ways in our life. Nobody escapes it. It is the modern plague in my opinion. And phishing is just the context of email. Uh, people sending you emails to try to take advantage of you in some way, to get information, to steal something from you, to attack you in some way, to take advantage, who knows what it may be. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And, and so, I, go ahead, go ahead. I was just saying, at the, at the most basic level, a phish email, uh, is somebody sending you a fake email uh, with the intent, intent to be deceptive to take advantage of you. Mm -hmm. I just did a presentation the other day and I said, you know, back in 2000, this was our email cybersecurity training. It was, okay, if you get an email that has misspellings and it's from a Nigerian prince, that's probably bad. Anything <laughs> else is probably just fine. So you're good. Look the spelling <laughs> and the Nigerian prince and that was where the bar was. Yeah. Well, you know, if you think I was tracked through time, it was, it was originally, you know, yeah, crazy, weird, un unintelligible emails and Nigerian princes asking you to launder money for mm -hmm. them because they're going to have billions of dollars for you, right? Mm -hmm. And then it turned into, you know, not so misspelled, but still not quite right emails. Uh, still things that are somewhat obvious to see, like I didn't ask for an email from Microsoft about something. Well, I mean, that's not even a great example. I mean, so they were just stupid. They didn't even, they were obvious. Now they're faking actual organizations and they actually send emails that look real. And sometimes that fish, in fact, is a real email message from that account that has been compromised. Mm -hmm. And so there's absolutely nothing to detect it as a bad email. It just simply is the intent of who actually sent it because we don't know who hit the send button when that email goes necessarily. And so we always have to be careful with what information we give out. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, so what are some examples of phishing techniques to be on alert for? Well, I, I would say there's some that seem to come up really common. Uh, the first is, um, uh, well, the one that's probably the most destructive that we've seen some version of people falling for still all the time are fake emails, deceptive emails that specifically target wire transfers. Mm -hmm. So like uh, um, we had a customer that was going through a process of closing a deal with a new customer. They were having an email conversation about, um, getting a wire transfer for payment for their services. It was a pretty significant deal, fair amount of money involved. And then right before the wire transfer was due, another email came giving different wire instructions that looked like it was from the same person. And clearly they had been following the email conversation and knew exactly how to say and how to make it look. And the wire transfer information, fortunately this customer had the policy to never do a change or a wire transfer without verbal confirmation, which is just an example of one of the ways that you prevent one of the most common ones is don't transfer money from just an email, no matter who it's from, uh, because uh, that could be fraudulent. Uh, and, and so, you know, there's, there's deceptive phishing like that. There's a, a ter term called spear phishing where it's very targeted, like multiple sources will try to target one particular person, maybe an accountant or a CFO or a CEO. Uh, and, uh, you know, in fact, CEO is sort of its own category as well, too. But spear phishing is a targeted campaign for multiple sources over a period of time, not just a random one. And we see that's a lot more effective. And that one, that one tends to cause actual problems more often, too. Um, there's really common CEO fraud there uh, where people will send an email making it look like it's from the CEO asking them to do something. I mean, like, I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody like within their first couple of days of employment, get a fake email from their boss asking them to buy a bunch of Home Depot gift cards because mm -hmm. they need to give them out to customers. They give them some reason 
and uh, I mean, legitimately, it happened to one of our new employees where I'm talking to him like on day two, and they're like, oh, I'm about to go get those Home Depot gift cards for him. I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Uh, and so, I mean, it can, it can happen to anybody, mm-hmm. uh, and that's just an example of it. But I think it's also important to know this concept of phishing or social engineering is also, you know, rarely, but sometimes it's somebody showing up your door as a delivery driver who really isn't a delivery driver. But the ones that we see most often are the fake emails, but also what we call voicemail phishing or vishing, mm-hmm. uh, where people send a, a leave you a voicemail pretending to be somebody they're not. I mean, a lot of, a lot of us know have got the your car's extended warranty is about to go out. Mm-hmm. That's the one that gets, you know, that's a really common example. Or there's ones that will say, hey, you know, the police are looking for you. The IRS is coming after you. There's all sorts of ones that, in my opinion, are fairly obvious. I think most of us have a reference to now because yeah. everybody gets them. I think I heard a statistic from some of the um, um, uh, cellular providers that over 50% of the texting and voicemail traffic that goes over their network is for fraudulent purposes for things like that. You know, that's incredible. And be honest, don't quote me on the statistic because I could be wrong, but it just seems believable. And I just know it's a lot. So it sounds like your puppy dog's barking back there. He's going crazy. Hold on. I got to give him. Okay, No problem. Sorry about that. No, no worries. Okay. All right. So, so, next so, so those are vishing is another one. And then I'd say the last one is, you know, texts that uh, text messages or SMS phishing or as it's called smishing, because we have to have funny names for everything. Phishing, vishing, smishing. They're all forms of pretending to be somebody you're not to try to take advantage of somebody. And we've probably all in our personal lives seen the modern equivalent of the Nigerian prince ones that are pretty easy to tell, but just remember some of them are absolutely look legitimate and they are in fact, not the person that's sending it to you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. They're very good looking these days. So what are some quick and easy security protocols to put in place to avoid a phishing attack? Well, I think it kind of comes down to a, a two things. One is you want to work to prevent your email from becoming compromised so that they can't use your account to learn about you, learn about your business, or to send things out pretending to be you. Mm-hmm. So you got to work to prevent the email compromise of your own email. Um, you know, And the number one thing to prevent somebody from getting into your email, I think it kills 80% of the risk, is to just simply use multi-factor authentication for email so that not only do you use a username and password to log in, but you have uh, a text or a, a one-time code from an app or there's a few different versions of it. The best version is from the app. Texting can become compromised as well. It's better than not being turned on though. I'll tell you that. But you know, the most ideal is you actually use the version that has an app that may, generates a one-time code that you type in. And you don't have to type it in every time you look at email, just every time you set up email like on a new device or things like that. Mm-hmm. But that, that, that kills a significant amount of the risk of your business email compromise, uh, uh, preventing that business email compromise. Uh, then the other thing is, is look, um, whoever's receiving email needs to be aware and constantly suspicious of every text, voicemail, and, and email that they get. Um, and know and understand that some are gonna be obvious and easy to see and you know not, not too big, but some will be real. And so there's a few things that you need to always have in the back of your mind about any email you're getting. Like, is it asking for, Password is asking for information that um, is going to be compromising. Is it asking for things that can give access to money or private information? These are all concerns that really should never be asked for or given out via email. In my opinion, the only way you can really prevent that in mass, because they only have to be right once, you have to be right all the time, is to be constantly training your end users. In the industry, this is just called end user awareness training. There's several tools and utilities to kind of modify or, or I mean, to automate that and make sure it's reported on and done. But re- the problem is, is you really have to have coverage across the board. Everybody needs to be trained in it. So. All right. So our next one is what are the benefits of the ongoing training? I think you just talked about that. And that's what we all need to remember is that this isn't a let's do it one time and then forget all about it. This has got to be ongoing, right? Well, yeah. So uh, as uh, you know, back, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago, companies would do end use awareness training. And what it was is in some annual meeting, say carve out 10 minutes to say, hey, these are things to be looking out for and be careful 
Maybe even they had an annual meeting that was a whole hour just dedicated to IT cybersecurity if they're more conscientious, but that just doesn't work in today's environment. Things move too quickly. And to be perfectly frank, once a year is far too big of a gap of time frame. And so really a good uh, end user awareness training has a couple elements. One is it's constant. It gives out regular updates. It stays up to date and gives people warnings of new things that are coming out, new ways that people are being uh, uh, compromised uh, and, and keeps them up to date and actually involves them taking tests, like shows them example of fake emails and they have to identify the things on it that are wrong. Uh, and, and if they're not doing that, like somewhat regularly, we, our, our guards come down. I, I also think every good end user awareness training is going to have some type of simulation testing going on so that um, you're actually sending fake texts, voicemails and emails to people to see if they properly identify it. Uh, and if they don't, you know, that's understandable and it's human. And hopefully they can learn from it and do better next time. But you can provide additional training as well. And so, you know, from our perspective, that's generally how we approach it is we set everybody up for monthly videos they have to watch. They take a small test. And we also send out simulated emails and voicemails and text messages on a, on a monthly basis. And then uh, for those that um, essentially fall for them, uh, click on it or open an attachment, we provide additional training to help them, you know, come along. Uh, you know, the, the thing that freaks me out as a business owner and as a person who manages IT for other companies is, you know, 99% of people can have everything that they need and understand. It just takes one to make the mistake at the wrong time. And so it's just important to have an extra level of vigilance about this. Yeah. And I think people think differently when they're online than they do face to face. So this is yeah. a good this is a good topic for us to talk about. Is, is it is expensive to develop a security awareness training program? Well, I don't know that it, I, I, look, it's a lot easier than it used to be because there are providers out there that you can subscribe to that actually make it relatively inexpensive and easier to track than ever before. It's more about the time and effort and energy to just make sure it's managed and executed well. Like every time a new employee comes on, are they properly enrolled? When people are terminated, are you get disconnecting the license? There's an ongoing management to it, but I, I you know, the, the cost of actual training through the available programs is not very much anymore. It's it's pretty it's pretty reasonable, and so uh, it's not that difficult. That's one thing I want people to realize is that this is not expensive to put into place. It really is not. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's true. I mean, as a guy, as a as a guideline, I would say you know, in your company, for every fifty people you have, you can expect to pay about a thousand dollars a year, um, and so it's not too bad. That's not bad. Hold on. I'm going to get him because he's not quieting. Okay. No problem. Oh, it's a little bulldog. Oh, I didn't hear. I'm not hearing you anymore. I'm muted. Okay. You're going to say hi. Where is he? Hello. Hello. Okay. And now you're going to say What a cute little bulldog. This is Hank. Hank. Hank the terror. He's either like a maniac or he's sleeping. So there's mm. stop and go. That's it. So I apologize about this. Yeah, no, for it. no problem. All right. Here's the next one. So what's involved in a solid security awareness training program? Well, you know, I think it kind of alluded to some of this already. But, you know, for me, the core elements are regular updated training. We recommend around the time frame of monthly it's doing it. Uh, some type of video and some type of awareness. Uh, and with it, it, I also think it's important that the people have to interact with it and take some kind of quick quiz or test at the end so you ensure they actually watched it. Um, and I think a good uh, end user awareness training involves the simulation I was referring to before. So you're actually testing it with, you know, actual fake emails to see how people respond outside of the training. So a little bit of testing uh, to make it feel like um, they're actually looking at uh, a phishing email and see how they respond. Um, and I think that the, 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 the other piece is that, you know, you just do regular vulnerability testing like that beyond just, um, uh, beyond just the, the phishing simulations, but in your organization, you need to be scanning for vulnerabilities. You need to be making sure other ways like 
For instance, how would you know somebody's logged into your email if you don't have a utility that can test for that, you know, other than the actual end user? So there, there's just other things you need to do on the back end that you should be asking your IT provider or, or whatever company provides your cybersecurity to make sure they're on top of from a vulnerability management standpoint as well. And so like, that's not really directly end user awareness training, but it's an important part of what you should have in your just overall security plan. And it feeds into the same thing. But, you know, end user awareness training is just something that, uh, you know, regular cadence and involves simulations. You've got a lot of it going at that point. Well, and it also makes them, the employees understand that they may be tested every once in a while. So it's something they do have to continually think about, not just, okay, good, I'm doing my training and now I don't have to worry about it for another month or a year or whatever the case may be. Yeah, you know, it's interesting as we've been doing this for a while with our customers, um, the value of the simulation of catching them, answering a simulation is one thing. But I've really got the sense that the value is that they know they're going to be tested. And that alone makes them be more cautious mm -hmm. uh, because they don't always think of every email as as scary or a potential attack. But they're like, oh, I don't want to show up on that report as somebody that clicked the simulation <laughs> test. It legitimately changes behavior. And I think for the better. And if nothing else, that, that's the problem with all this, this anonymous kind of stuff that can be sent purporting to be v emails, texts and, and voicemails. You just need to have your suspicions in place. You just need to be like thinking through, is this something that somebody would have just randomly invited me to this meeting we didn't talk about? So I should click on this meeting invite or did I ever ask for this attachment? Is this related to anything I'm actually doing? I mean, some of this is just about having that thought process of always questioning, is this a legitimate communication? You know? mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. So this was really, really good. Thank you for all of this. And this is a very important topic that we need to spend a lot more time, you know, talking about because this is how most of the problems are happening. So well, it's the basics, right? Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I think the statistic is over 90% of uh, successful attacks begin with email compromise. And and the, this phishing and, and smishing, and these are the ways that they, they, they begin the process. Mm -hmm. And if you can stop it at the head, you can prevent other worse and, and more destructive things from happening in the future that, that, that stem from it. Yep, so. absolutely. Well, thank you, Carl. I appreciate your time and all of your input and everything. And uh, again, um, Hank says, he's <laughs> sorry for interrupting. <laughs> hey, it's the world we live in now, right? Uh, we're, we're working from all sorts of places from home. I like yeah. little doggies. I think that's great. Oh, good, good, good. Well, I'm glad, thank you for understanding. <laughs> no problem. Thank right, you, everybody, care. for watching, and we hope to see you on the next episode. So take care. Bye-bye. All right. All right. Bye-bye.